the thoughts that I have to share tonight. If you have your Bibles and you'd open that place to Luke chapter 15, this is a common story, something we're all familiar with. You're going to say, how in the world does this story have anything to do with the walls falling at Jericho? And I guarantee you there is a correlation. If you stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word, Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 11, it's speaking of Jesus, and he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no longer, uh, no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, and had compassion, and ran, and fell on his neck, and kissed him. That's Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through uh, 20. Would you bow your heads with me? Master, we thank you, God, for this day. We thank you for the service this morning. We thank you, God, for your presence tonight. We ask God, in spite of the rain and the weather, and uh, as discouraging and depressing as these things can be, and our attendance is not what it could be tonight, we just ask, Lord, that your anointing would still rest upon your messenger. Help us, God, to say something that might be of help to the people of God at this hour and this time. For, Lord, we need to hear from you, not me. Master, grant it, I pray, for we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated today. This is not going to be real long. It's going to be very simple. I just want you to understand today, uh, this morning I talked about the issue of Jericho Jubilee. I talked about the fact that when Joshua and the people of Israel marched around the walls of Jericho, and God said, I want you to march one time, for six days, I want you to march one time each day. And on the seventh day, I want you to march seven times. And you'll notice that throughout that story, as we were reading, everything was filled with sevens. And you're going to have seven priests in front of the ark, and the seven priests will bear seven ram's horns. Everything was done in sevens. But the interesting thing was that the Lord used almost a mathematic equation in having the people of Israel to act out their march around the city of Jericho. For he told them, march once a day, six days in a row. But on the seventh day, what do we call the seventh day? The Sabbath. Right? The seventh day of the week is the Sabbath. On the seventh day, God did what? He rested. That's the Sabbath. He said, on the Sabbath, I want you to march seven times. You see, there's significance to this now. Because on the seventh day, they're marching seven times. On the first six days out of the seven, they marched one time each time. So what we had was, we had a mathematical equation that God created. And that equation was, how many days are they marching? Seven. How many times do we march on the Sabbath, which is the seventh day? Seven. Seven times on the seventh day times seven days would be 49. That meant that at the end of the seventh time on the seventh day, it was time for Jubilee. And that's why he said, now blow the trumpet. Now sound the horn. Because now it's your time to reclaim what was yours. Because it 
was not new territory for the people of Israel. The, uh, Jericho was not new territory. They were going back to what was theirs to begin with and reclaiming it. Hallelujah. And God said, when you're done seven times on the seventh day, it's jubilee, honey. Blow the horn. It's time to reclaim what's yours and take it back. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And this morning I talked about the fact that you have the right to reclaim. You have the right to take back what the enemy has stolen from you in times of difficulty and in times of trouble. Whew. You've got a right. The devil going to try to put up some walls and say, No, I've established myself here, and I'll stay here. Thank you. But I want, <laughs> I want you to know the devil got to go. Amen. Jesus is coming in and the devil got to go. It's that easy. He cannot stay, Manuel. He does not have a right to stay. You have a right to reclaim what is yours because the horns and the trumpets of Jubilee are sounded. You have the right to reclaim what's yours. Now, that's a recap of this morning's message. Now, I want you to understand, here we have the Lord in parable form telling us about a man that has two sons. And one son decides he wants to go out in the world and do his own thing and live his own life and party it up and have a good time. And he makes all the wrong decisions. And it costs him dearly. And when he stops for a minute and he begins to think about all the decisions he's made, and he looks around and realizes, man, you know, for all the decisions I've made, look where I am. You ever done that? Oh, God. <laughs> for all the decisions, you know, for some of the decisions I've made, for some of the people I've chosen to marry, now look where I'm at. Hey, man, you know what I'm talking about, right? Or... For all the people I've decided to get involved in a relationship with, now look at the disaster I'm in. For the, for the decisions that we make and we leave God out of, because we don't want to do it God's way, sometimes we just get it in our head that we know a better way. And Lord, I'm going to do it like this. And we wind up ultimately in an extremely ugly, extremely negative situation. The Bible said he winds up hiring himself off to a man who, who hires him to feed swine. Can you imagine being the son of a multimillionaire and suddenly here you are working for four bucks an hour feeding somebody's pigs? And because your debts are so high and your income is so low, you haven't even got money to go to Kroger and buy nothing, so you start looking at the pig swap and saying, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. looks good to me. Right? That's what this boy was doing. But you know what? I want you to understand tonight. I mentioned it this morning briefly, but I want you to understand tonight. You can go home again. You can go home again. You can go back to where you started. You can have what you once had. You can. That's what Jubilee is all about, is restoration. That's what Jubilee is all about, is getting you back to where you started from. Amen. And starting from a, a, a position of a clean slate. And that's what Jubilee is all about. But I want you to know, some people wind up, uh, they, they lose out with God, and they lose out in their relationship with God, and they wind up uh, doing things they never dreamed they'd do and going places they never dreamed they'd go. And as time goes by, they say, oh, God, I don't like this. I really want to be back to where I was, but, oh, God, I can't go home again. Oh, yes, you can. Oh, yes, you can. Here's where these two stories tie in together now. Now you got to follow me. Yes, you can go home again because, children, I want you to know, Jericho has no right to stand where it, where it is your property, it is your land, God has given it to you, and the people of Jericho are just simply going to have to go. You can go home again. Don't say, oh, but things have changed. It's not like it used to be. Oh, it was wonderful when Brother Gillen was pastoring, and what a wonderful church we had, and oh, how the Spirit of the Lord used to move, and how great things were, but I can't go back to that. Brother Gillum's gone. Sister Gillum's gone. Oh, so many people from Riverside Church are gone. I can't go 
I wish my cousin was here tonight to hear this message because she needs to hear this message. She needs to understand, oh, you can go back home. <laughs> what made it home was the presence of God. What made it home was the power of the Holy Ghost. It wasn't Brother Gillum that made it home. It wasn't Sister Gillum that made it home. It was the Riverside Church that made it home. Come on now. It's not about them. It's about Him. Hallelujah. It, it, once you get to understand, honey, that what you really want to get back to is that level of relationship with the Lord, that level of intimacy that you once had with God, that's what you're striving to get back to. You can go home again. A little boy, Mom, you remember hearing me preach a couple of years back about this time. I talked about, excuse me, this very text. And I mentioned the fact that no matter where that boy was, no matter what decisions he made, regardless of what hideous position he put himself in, when it was all said and done, he knew in the back of his mind that he was still his father's son. Oh, my. He knew that in spite of everything, that the bottom line was he was still his father's son. He said, I'm going to go back and say, Father, oh, wait a minute. What are you going to say? Father, why are you going to call him Father? Because he's my Father, hallelujah. I haven't forgotten it, and I know he hasn't forgotten that I'm his son, hallelujah. When he sees me, he'll know me. When I see him, I'll know him. Hallelujah. Well, I want you to know, I don't care what kind of decisions you make. I don't care what kind of goofy, screwed up situations you put yourself in. God doesn't forget that he's your father. <laughs> and, and children, don't you ever forget that you're his son and you're his daughter. Amen. Don't you ever forget that. Amen. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. It wasn't too bad, is it? So I'll tell you, hear that prodigal son we call him. He decided he's going to go back. And he's going to repent before his father and against heaven and against you. I've broken the laws of God. I've broken the commandments of God. I've dishonored my Father. And in the process of doing so, I've dishonored the law of God. That, Father, I've also sinned against you. I've brought reproach to your name, to the family name, and to the reputation of our great family. I've done things that people now are going to say, Oh, remember that Williams boy? He did thus and so. And oh, you know, how many people, when you mention the name Kennedy? Well, the first thing I think of is Chappaquiddick. Right? Because let one of the sons go off and do something stupid, and boy, that's going to mark that name forever, isn't it? You know what I'm talking about. Amen. And that's what happened with this prodigal. He knew. I've done tarnished the name. I've done tarnished my family name. Now, how many people out there today, when they hear the word Christian, it don't mean anything to them anymore because they're so used to seeing Christians who don't know how to act any different than the world acts. So they don't think Christian means anything any different than anybody else because they've seen enough so-called Christians, professing Christians, who are out there doing all the same junk, living the same way as all the ungodly people. Because they've tarnished the name. They've been out there making decisions and making choices that weren't right. That wound up leaving them in a miserable place. But you know what, man? Well, when it's all said and done, all you need to remember is you have a father. Amen. And he's still at home. And you can go home again. You can go home again. And I want you to know that things may be different than they were the last time. But that doesn't mean that they have to be worse. Amen. Things may be different than they were when you were there last, but that does not mean they have to be worse 
The devil wants you to believe that if you've ever left God and been away from God for any period of time, that when you come back, he wants you to believe that it'll never be the same. It'll never be like it was. It'll never be uh, the way it was before you decided to go off and do this stupid thing or to go off and do that stupid thing. It'll never be like it was before all of this. That's what the devil will tell you. But I want you to know it. I want you to understand today. You've got an answer for the devil when he feeds you that line of baloney. And the answer is this. That's right, devil. It will never be like it was. I anticipate that it's going to be far better. Hallelujah. It's going to be better this time around. Because I've learned my lesson. And now I appreciate the comforts of home. I appreciate what my father does for me. I appreciate what my father provides for me. I appreciate all the comfort and security that I am uh, afforded in my father's house. So devil, you're right. Can't be the same. Just going to have to be better. Amen. There's only one way to make it. It's got to be better. You know, it's funny. I've heard people talk about marital relationships and, you know, sometimes I watch Oprah. Don't we all? <laughs> Oprah, I always thought that Joe and I had a good relationship. Next thing I know, I found out he was messing around with Mary Sue. But you know what, Oprah? We worked through our problems, and we were committed to our marriage and to our children and to our family. And I have to tell you, I think our relationship now is better. See, it's a lie of the devil makes you want to believe that because of some circumstance or some situation that things can't be the same. And you just say, that's right, Dennis. You're right. I agree 100%. They can't be the same. They're just going to have to be better. The only way I'm going to be able to deal with this situation, the only way I can see that wife looking at her husband every morning, the only way she's going to be able to deal with that fool every morning is that things are better now than they were last time around. You hear me now? He got better about being affectionate. He got better about being attentive to me. He got better about this. He got better about romance. He got better about this. And blah, 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 blah. Yeah, when you go home, things may not be the same. But they can be better. They can be better. And that's an important thing to remember. You see, one of the wonderful things about the children of Israel going back into the land of uh, Canaan, after they had been in bondage for 400 years in Egypt, after the trumpets of Jubilee had been sounded and they marched around the walls of Jericho and the trumpets were sounded and the walls fell, there's a wonderful thing about all those cities that they had conquered en route to Jericho. You know, the Bible said in our text this morning that Jericho was shut up because of the people of God because of the people of Israel. That great big walled city that had a reputation of being impregnable was terrified of God's people. Do you know why they were terrified of God's people? Because there was city after city after city that the people of Israel had conquered on their way to Jericho. Jericho was just going to be another a victory in the Israelis' armor notch, and they knew it, and they were terrified, and they said, hey, these people have been winning one battle after another, after another, after another. If we have any hope of survival, we need to shut ourselves up in here tight and hope they can't get through our walls. God don't need to get through your walls. Tell you a little secret. God was inside your walls. Amen. Amen. <laughs> he was inside your walls. He was outside your walls. Amen. Honey, you could keep Israel out, but you couldn't keep the God of Israel out. Right. And when he wants to let somebody in, all he does is drop the walls. And say, all right, now instead of walls, what we have here is what we call side walls. <laughs> Y'all come on in now. Set a spell. Have a meal with us. You see, Manuel, one of the great things, one of the wonderful things about 
Israel marching back into the land of Canaan after 400 years of captivity. One of the wonderful things, listen to this now. They were able to occupy houses that they didn't build. They were able to harness oxen that they didn't even have to breed. You hear me now? They were able to access all kinds of resources that they didn't have one hand in obtaining. You hear me now? I told you, when you go back home, it may not be the same, but honey, it can be better. It can be better. And I want you to know today, <laughs> I want you to know, the children of Israel are very much a type of that prodigal son. <laughs> they went into uh, the, the land of Egypt originally. They went into Egypt because of famine in their land. And they fell at the feet of Joseph, not knowing the 11 men, not knowing that was their youngest brother, Joseph. And yet, they were invited in originally as guests. And yet when they left, they left as freed slaves. I'm going to tell you, honey, if you don't think the devil will try to get you to frequent the nudie bars and the booby bars and the, and the, the alcohol joints, and if he, you think he won't invite you to do half these things of your own free volition, Oh, yes, you don't need the devil crawl up in you and make you to do some of the stupid things he wants you to do. No, 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 no. Honey, a lot of times he'll just invite you. And then you walk in free, and guess what? When you turn around to walk out, you can't because now you're bound. That's why people get addicted to stuff, because they walk in free. But when they turn around to leave, they find out, brother, they can't. They're bound now. Now their hands are tied and their feet are in stock. And now they're somebody's slave. And now they have to serve another master who calls the shop and tells them what they can and can't do and when they can and can't do it. But you see, they walked in. They went in voluntarily. The people of Israel went in voluntarily. That prodigal son, he did not leave his father's house because he was kicked out. He left voluntarily. He made the choice. Israel made some really dumb choices. One of those choices was to turn to Egypt for relief in a time of famine rather than turn to God. Hello. Amen. Y'all have heard me talk about it in recent weeks. The Lord is disgusted with this country. Because in time of trouble, we've been turning to our leaders and we've been turning to our military and putting our confidence in them rather than turning to God. How do you think God felt when uh, Isaac and his sons are experiencing a great famine in Canaan and they decide to turn to Egypt for relief rather than him? Make a dumb decision, you're going to live with the consequences. So they marched in voluntarily. Here I come. And they wound up slaves. And four lifetimes later, 400 years later, a man finally rises up from the ranks and says, Folks, Y'all been looking in the wrong direction for too long. God wants you to look toward him. And I'm going to give you the opportunity to follow me out of this place because the Lord sent me to lead you out. And God led the children of Israel back out of the land of Egypt, back through the wilderness for 40 years till they finally reached Canaan land. And then God gave them victory after miraculous victory after miraculous victory as they reclaimed territory that already belonged to them. And you know what? They harvested all kinds of crops that they didn't plant. God said, I'll cause you to reap where you have not sown. <laughs> and they began to harvest crops. 
You hungry? Sure, I'm hungry. Well, let's go eat. Well, what are we going to eat? We hadn't planted nothing. We didn't have to plant nothing. There was a whole civilization here before we got here. And they planted plenty. Because when you go home, it's not the same. It's better. It's better. You can go home again. That boy went back to his father's house. And as he's running back to his father's house, and he's running in his mind, he's running through his little speech. Father, I've sinned against you, and I can just see him now. Probably I should eke out a tear right about now. Father, I've sinned against you. <laughs> and against heaven. <laughs> Might even have offended Mother Mary. <laughs> I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but make me as a hired servant instead. But you know, the glorious, glorious, wonderful lesson that we see in that story is that the Bible says that as the son was approaching the house, and while he was still afar off, his father saw him and came running. Oh, hallelujah. I want you to know when you make some dumb choices and make some dumb decisions and wind up in some dumb places, God is always sitting on the front porch looking off toward the horizon, looking to see if, oh glory, if some little speck of, of sand is going to appear that he can identify from two miles away as his son. Because, honey, he knows you when he sees you. And he's able, even though you're not even fully recognizable from that confidence in us. He has confidence in us. He believes we'll come to our senses. He believes we'll figure it out. He believes that we'll be back. And he's looking for us in the process. And I want you to know the <laughs> Bible says that the Father and the Son come together you know, the Bible said, draw nigh unto God, he'll draw nigh unto you. You start, you start running toward Daddy, honey, and Daddy's going to start running toward you. You can bank on it. The Bible said that when they got together and embraced, the son started in with his little pitiful speech. Oh, I sinned against him, and then I sinned against you, and I'm no longer worthy. They called your son, and blah, 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 blah. And the father's reaction was, he called his servants and said, Hey, get me a robe. Get me a ring. Kill the fattest cow I've got. Why? Listen, because this my son, <laughs> this my son was dead, but now is alive. Hallelujah. I want you to know today, honey, it's never about how worthy you are to be his son. It's not about how worthy you are to be his son. Once he's adopted you, whether you're foul or whether you're fair, whether you're holy or whether you're profane, the fact of the business is you're a child of God. You bear his name. You bear his stamp and his seal in your soul. That son was coming with all the wrong things to say. Father, I'm no more worthy. And the father said, you weren't worthy to begin with. I didn't adopt you because you were worthy. I adopted you because I loved you. Amen. God didn't adopt us then well because we were worthy. He adopted us because he loved us. So to come back and let the devil beat you out of victory, all because... Uh, he's convinced you that you're not worthy to be a child of God. Well, of course I'm not. Devil, let's just settle this right here and now. I'm not worthy to be nothing. So why don't we just not even have that argument? Amen? Go to cast out a devil and the devil try to 
bring up your own sins and he'll try to accuse you of things, false and true at times, in order to distract you. All you got to do is remind him, devil, <coughs> let's settle this fact once and for all. It's not about how good I am. It's not about how holy I am. It's not about how worthy I am. It's about how holy and how worthy and how wonderful my father is. And my father said that when I tell you to shut up and go, you got to shut up and go. So shut up and go. Amen. Whoa, glory. I want you to know you can go home again. <laughs> you can go home again. That's what Jubilee is all about. You lost your homestead. In times of distress and in difficult times, God said when Jubilee is founded, He said that homestead goes right back to you. But like I said this morning, and think about this now, with repossession or restoration, whichever term you wish to use, comes responsibility. My grandmother, I used this example in a message earlier on a similar topic to this, and I talked about the fact that my grandmother, when my grandfather died, uh, sold her house to her kids because she couldn't afford to keep the house and make all the taxes and all that stuff. Well, now, guess what? Jubilee comes. Grandma suddenly handed the deed to her house back. Suddenly she's handed the keys to the front door back. And guess what? Grandma's situation isn't any different than it was when she lost the house. <laughs> but with that restoration comes responsibility. Now she's responsible to pay the taxes once again. She's responsible to do the maintenance once again. A lot of us won't pray for Jubilee. Lord, restore, restore, restore. Are you in a better place now than you were before? Are you in a different situation now than you were before? So that if those things should be restored to you, you could maintain them? So you could keep them? Or are you going to wind up going through another experience of loss? And then you're going to have to wait 49 more years for Jubilee to get it back. You hear me now? This is one reason why if you look at the principles of Jubilee in the Old Testament, you'll see that God very carefully articulates how the people of Israel ought to conduct themselves in business one with another uh, based upon the Jubilee year. Because obviously, if you're going to buy a piece of property and next year is Jubilee, that might not be a good idea. So the Lord is explaining how the people of Israel ought to conduct themselves and how they ought not to take advantage of one another. He said, because if you do take advantage of one another, Jubilee is just going to even the score. But at the same time, if you're in a bad place and you lose everything, and then Jubilee is founded and you're still in a bad place, then you really haven't gained anything. Because now you've regained responsibility for something that you can't afford to maintain. So what is God wanting us to do? It's easy. God says, if you know Jubilee's coming, get ready. For crying out loud. Get in a position to be ready to take back what was yours. Get in a position to be ready so that when Jubilee's uh, trumpets are sounded, you'll be in a position to start making house pay uh, tax payments again. You'll be in a position to start making uh, insurance payments again, or whatever the case might be. See, basically what it all amounts to, if I could put it in two words, it's simple. It's called personal growth. The Lord says, I want you all to concentrate on growing. Amen. I want you to concentrate on developing as a human being so that when Jubilee comes, you'll be in a better position than you were when you lost everything. And you'll be ready to take on the responsibilities associated with those things that you're going to regain. And that way, when you go home again, like the prodigal son, life won't be the same. It'll be better. And it can be better because you can go home again. You know, sometimes we make decisions which leave us in bad places. The enemy wants to make you believe that you can never escape your present circumstance 
or situation. But children, know this today, if you remember nothing else that I've said, if you have ever been a child of the King, you remain today a child of the King. Amen. Romans 8, beginning at verse 10, the word of the Lord declares, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage, again, to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You see, Manuel, we've been adopted into this family, and it's not about our worthiness. That's where that son made his mistake. Father, I'm not worthy. And the father said, yeah, what else is new? You think you're not worthy because you went out and did the things you did? I got news for you. If you have stayed at home and, and lived here and done all the things you're supposed to do, you still wouldn't be worthy. How many parents achieve massive fortune and then leave that to their children, and their children are no more worthy of those fortunes? Why? Because they didn't do a single living thing to earn them. They're not even deserving of the millions and billions of dollars that they inherited because they didn't do a thing in the world to, 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 to earn it. They didn't do a thing in the world to contribute to it. But you know what? They might come before their father and say, well, I'm not worthy. Father say, no kidding. Yeah, when you're old enough, you started working in my business, and you became a president of one of my companies, and yada, yada, yada. Yeah, that's all well and good, but you know what? Before you were ever born, I built five companies and had half a billion dollars in the bank. So you're not worthy. You didn't deserve. You didn't earn what you got. You don't get what you got because of what you did. You get what you got because of whose you are. And only the lucky folks get adopted by millionaires. How many people? Look, at I see. I think of how lucky Dave Thomas is, how blessed he was. Here's a man who was adopted as a young person, right? Turned around and come up with an idea for business, became a multimillionaire, was extremely successful, did very well for himself, Wendy's founder, you know. Boy, I'll tell you. It's a wonderful thing to be adopted by the right people. Well, i got news for you today, and I'm closing right now. We've been adopted by the right people. Amen. God has adopted us and made us his own. And today, whether you want to look at it like going home again, or whether you want to look at it like going back into the land that is yours, that you have been in dispossession of for a number of years, once you know either way, you can go home again. You can have what is yours. You can reclaim you can have restored. And yes, when you go home again, it may not be the same as it used to be. But I'll tell you what, children, if you'll just follow the leading of the Lord and let Him guide you and help you to grow, it'll be better. <laughs> Amen. Would you stand with me tonight? Amen. I promise you it'd be a little on the short side. That wasn't that short, but Tommy's making faces. Honestly, I need the restroom stuff ahead. I could explode. Y'all say, boy, he sure did pace back and forth a lot tonight. Well, that's what it is sometimes. <laughs> anyway, I hope that word encouraged you and helped you. Amen. I believe God is trying to tell us something. You can go home again. Who says you can't go home again? Yes, you can, devil. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. And when I get back there, it's going to be better. It's going to be better than when I left it. Amen. Master, we thank you, God, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for this message and this word. We thank you, God, for your presence in this place. 
We just ask, Lord, that every word that's been spoken would find its mark in the heart of the hearer. Help us, God, to walk away from this place changed, challenged, different than when we came in. Oh, God, help us to develop as people so that we can prepare ourselves for our own personal jubilee. So that when you restore those things to us, which the enemy has tried to rob us of, we'll be in a better position to maintain and retain those things. Master, today, in the name of Jesus, go with us, we pray. God, help us to meditate upon your word and contemplate its truth. Master, for those that would hear this message by tape, we pray, God, that you also would bless them and help them, Lord, to receive every word that's been spoken at this hour. Lord, that we might all be prepared at this moment for our jubilee. Master, we pray, help us to come home again. God, to be where you want us to be, to be in the right place at the right time for the right reasons, doing the right thing. We ask it all in the lovely name of the Lord Jesus Christ and Master. Amen. And the church said, Amen. God bless you in Jesus' name. You're dismissed.